a little bit. I have just cut us on. I am speaking with Mr. Thomas C. Oversby. Owensby. Owensby. O W E N S B Y. Winterville, Georgia. And we are in the boardroom of the Athens Regional Library, and today is September the 14th, Wednesday afternoon. And Mr. Owensby, I'm interested if you could tell me something of what you experienced during the era of World War II. Well, I, I was born in 1915, and of course that was before World War II, but uh, I finished high school in 1932, right in the middle of one of the biggest depressions this country had ever known. And I lived on a very small, small farm, very poor people. And so uh, during that next two years, I plowed a mule and picked cotton, pulled fodder and all that sort of stuff. During that time, you couldn't get a job doing anything. Uh, we, had, we had a small farm, as I say, and uh, many time I, I had worked for the neighbor for 50 cents a day chopping cotton. And of course, the 50 cents a day went, went quite, a, quite a long ways at that time. You could buy a gallon of gasoline for 12, 14, 16 cents a gallon and buy a new automobile for $700 if you had the $700. Anyway, uh, about in 1933, when I was 17, I decided to join the Navy. I had to get away from this plow and this mule. So I hitchhiked to Macon, the recruiting office. They gave me a physical exam. And I know they didn't say anything, but he turned me down. Hearing was bad. They took my blood pressure, and blood pressure was real high. They said, you better go see your doctor. I found out later they didn't warn anybody because I was just a skinny kid. They didn't warn anybody. They couldn't take anybody in the Navy because $21 a month, that's what the pay was then. Well, I went back home, applied a mule another year. Where was that family farm at home? It's, at one of, it's about, about five miles south of Wonderville on the edge of Oglethorpe County. Thank you. I still live on that place, same same land. Anyway, it's, it's over the over Oglethorpe County. It's, it's in the, just in Oglethorpe County. Thank you. But we get the mail from Winterville. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in 1934, uh, I decided I'd try to go to the university. So came up to the university about two weeks before they opened, and so they said, "What do you want to take?" And I said, "What you got? You know, we know nothing." And they said, wouldn't ask about money. We didn't have any money. Another friend of mine and I were up there. We said, we'll work, no job. So they said, well, if you were upper third of your grade class in high school, you could get $35 uh, tuition. I mean, get half the tuition for, for a quarter. It's only $35, $35 per quarter for the tuition uh, at that time. Well, my people dug up 1750, and then I had to get a few books and lab fees and so forth. So I managed to get through the University of Georgia and graduated in, in degree in agriculture in 1938. I doubt if I spent over $750 to get that degree. It was rough times those days. So in September of 1938, I got my first big job, making $120 a month. As I, I worked with Farm Security Administration, which is Farmers Home Administration at, at the present time. They changed the name of it. You can buy a new car seven, eight hundred dollars. So anyway, I was on my way up for that hundred and twenty dollars a month. I got fifty dollars a month of travel expenses. And then World War II came along. They had the draft board as everybody during that period remembers you put your name in they had the name in the fish bowl and fished it out and and uh uh you know you took took your turn and the draft board was kinda of pushing me in nineteen forty two so I decided to go in the Navy as midshipman. Where was that draft board's office? The draft board was at Lexington, the one I was I was assigned to. So anyway, I went to um, Columbia University and uh, lived a, a, a ten weeks course. It was supposed to be if you made it as a midshipman, then I would become an ensign in the Navy. Mathematics was my worst subject, and they 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 hit off in and all this stuff navigation. I think I took a ship right straight through Tennessee and on paper. So I don't think they wanted any, any navigators that could drive a ship no better than that. So uh, I came home about mid midways, but they, out of the 900 that was up there, uh, only about 400 made it, so it was pretty rough. And so one, one little thing of, uh, of a humor that came up while I was there, about the second or third week we were there, we had a khaki uniform 
we were out on this hot parade ground at uh, Columbia University. 900 of us were out there. 899 were in uniform, and one joker was out there with his raincoat on, hanging down to his ankles. I think he wanted to go home, and he did. We joined him pretty soon, and I was glad to get out of that place. Well, I, I knew then it was either Army or, or, or something, so I didn't want to go in the Army. I felt like I'd like to choose what I went in. So one Sunday night, I was listening to the radio, and uh, they said, if you've got four years of college, physical requirements, and age, uh, you could become a second lieutenant in 10 weeks in the Marine Corps. I said, boy, that's for me. So I went over and joined the next day. And, so they, said, well, they swore me in and they said, we'll call you. So middle of December 1942, I went into Marines. I, was, I thought it was a terrible mistake the first few days I was in the Marine Corps because it, it was rough. Went to Quantico, Virginia, just outside of Washington. and I wasn't used to snow. We got off the train. Oh, about 2 o'clock in the morning and biggest sergeant I ever saw standing out there and he said, all right, all you stupid college graduates, get off that train. And he double timed us up to this barracks and before daylight we had a uniform, sent our, packed up our civilian clothes to come back home and uh, it, it had breakfast. All this was before daylight and it, it, was, it was rough for 10 weeks. The schedule went on regardless of the weather. So we stayed there another 10 weeks in reserve officers class. And uh, during that time, we had a choice. We, we could uh, decide what, we, what t t type of duty we would like to have. And I decided, well, supply might be better. I, I hated all that walking and running up there, and I knew supply would be a little bit better than that. And I knew they had to have supply officers from someplace. So I put out supply. And I got selected to go to supply school, which is down at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. They were just building Camp Lejeune at that time. This was 19, still in 1943 then. And uh, so I went to supply school for 12 weeks, went on out to San Diego in the summer of 43, and was there a while. And then I got assigned as duties of battalion supply officer for a replacement battalion, which was 1,500 people. And uh, I had to be responsible for getting everything that that, that, per, that bunch of people could use while they were overseas. And uh, I did that, and I thought I did a pretty good job. I turned in all the records to the division supplier. So when we uh, joined later the 1st Marine Division, and then they assigned me to a rifle platoon in the infantry. That was a shock. Two weeks before we went in combat in December, I got inherited a rifle platoon. Didn't even know the men or nothing. And I, I had had this experience in supply, and, and I had kind of forgotten a little bit of that infantry training. Anyway. I managed to get through that thing, but we landed on Christmas Day of 1943 on a little island called New Britain. The other end of it was Rabaul, but nobody would, around here would ever know what that was, where it was, unless you just looked it up on the map. But anyway, you, 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 as we got off the boats going inland, we had to cut our way through the jungles, and vines were hanging on the water's edge. That We didn't have beaches like we have here. Vines were hanging on the water and your feet were still wet out here trying to cut the vines, trying to get into the jungles where the Japanese were. And the next 24 days, it rained. We, we landed there at the beginning of the monsoon season. And I just recently, I knew it rained an awful lot, but I just recently read something that where it, it was nothing to rain 20 inches in one day. And we were in that rain, right in it. You dig a hole at night just kind of like a shallow grave to keep from your head above the, above the dirt and so the traces could fly right over your head. Sometimes I felt like sticking my hand out to see if it could get, get hit, maybe and get out of that mess. But anyway... Did you get all pruny? Yeah, it still, still have them. But uh, it, it was pretty rough. We were right in all that rain for that whole period of time and never changed clothes or anything. And we had a ration called sea ration in those days. It was terrible. It, it, uh, you couldn't hardly eat the stuff. And I got down to the point where I, I could eat the chocolate out of it. That was about it, because you just couldn't eat that food. And I, I didn't much care where I lived or died those days. It just didn't matter much. But anyway, after about 24, 23 or 4 days, it, the, the battle got over. I decided right then and there, I'm going to get out of this infantry. So I started going around to different regiments. And I went up to the, to the artillery regiment, which was the 11th Marines. and. Uh, 
Uh, what was before you move on? What was the name of that island one more time? New is New Britain. Is the Thanks. other end is Rabaul, and uh, it's it's just north of Australia, just north of New Guinea. Thank you. About a couple hundred miles north of New Guinea, and the the the, the climate is terrible at that place. But anyway, uh, we got through that, and we were there another month or two before we moved. But in the meantime, I, I went up to the 11th Marines and uh, talked to this this colonel. He was kind of a weird character. Uh, I, I went in his tent and I knocked, you know, second lieutenant scared to death to talk to a colonel. And he said, come over here, lieutenant, and hold this light for me. He had a little 30-watt bulb hanging in the, in the tent and with a little green shade on it. He was working on a generator. I thought it was kind of strange for the colonel to be working on a generator, but he was really a mechanic at heart. He loved, be, loved mechanics. And after a little while, uh, he said, now what can I do for you? And I told him, I said, Colonel, I said, I'm in the 7th Marines and I would like to transfer up here. He said, why don't you, why do you want to transfer? I said, well, I don't like the infantry. And he surprised me. He said, I don't like it either. He was in artillery. See, artillery has plenty of trucks, bulldozers, transportation of all sorts. And there was a little bit behind the lines. And so he never did give me an answer. He quizzed me all afternoon. It was getting dark, and I was about seven miles from where I'd hitchhiked up there that day, pouring down rain. He said, come on and have a supper with me. Well, we went over to, his, over to their mess hall, and uh, he had a table all by himself. He didn't eat with any inferior grades whatsoever. No lieutenant colonels or nothing else. He ate by himself, and I was over there with him. Anyway. After we got through with that, he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get you transferred up here to be my motor transport officer. He said, I want somebody that knows nothing about motor transport. I said, you got your man right here, but I know nothing about motor transport. I hadn't mentioned supply, because I, I want to get out of that thing. And he said, I need a motor transport, that I, a man that, that I can train. So uh, I, he said, I want you, I, I want you to you and my driver to tear this Jeep down, take the motor out, and uh, grind the valves, and put in new, new uh, uh, rod inserts and all that stuff, and reline the brakes on my Jeep right here, and I'll supervise both of you. He said, I'm gonna make a mechanic out of you. Anything to get out of it, no matter, matter with me, the second lieutenant or not, I was out there greasy with the, with the PFC mechanic. But anyway, uh, we did it, and we got the Jeep back together pretty well with the help of Help of the master mechanic down there. Every time the colonel would leave, we, we kind of maneuvered around and got a little bit of help. It was got, both got stuck. Anyway, I was the motor transport officer there for two or three months. And then one came in from the States, and uh, so I, I was living in the tent with the regimental supply officer, and he was about ready to come back to the States. He, he was on the Guadalcanal, and they, they, they didn't stay out there forever. But anyway, he had told the colonel I had been through supply school. He called me down there, and kind of shooting me out. He said, why didn't you tell me about supply when you, I first saw you? I said, well, you didn't ask, and I want to get out of, out of the infantry. He said, well, you, you could be my regimental, uh, artil uh, regimental uh, supply officer from here on out. So anyway, I, I, I did supply from there on during the rest of the war. But, but after that, we, uh, we, went to, we were on a rest camp at that time uh, uh, called Pavuvu. And, uh, uh, we had left uh, New Britain, and and we were on Pavu about that time, and so um, we uh, Pavu was a chain of, of the Russell Islands. There was a bunch of little bitty islands there, maybe two or three miles wide or something. We landed in an island with twenty thousand people, and had to put up tents and all that sort of stuff, and and uh, they were they were absolutely uh, no place for us to live or nothing else. It was it, it was it was terrible the living conditions we had there in this so-called rest camp. Coconut trees were, had been planted 40, 50 feet tall, and we lived in that rainy section. And then in September the 15th, we landed on uh, Peleliu. That, this was in 44 now. Peleliu was way on up the line, kind of close to Guam, on up, up that area in the, in the North Pacific. And Peleliu was the worst landing that, that I made while I was out there. It was an island about two miles wide and about seven miles long, and that was it. The lower end had an airfield, 
and uh, the other end was just jagged rock. And maybe, maybe the, the little mountains, hills would go up and down like so. And, and the, the Japanese had been there for years, and they had dug out holes and caves in that, that thing. They had it well fortified around there. And, and to make matters worse, there was a coral reef all the way around that thing. And if you didn't land there just exactly when the tide was in, you got hung out of, up on that coral trying to get in with the landing boats. So it was pretty rough at that, that, uh, Peleliu. The, we, we were there about 16 days, I think, and we, lost, we had about f almost 50% casualties, either wounded or killed, on Peleliu. We didn't have but just a few yards uh, at all on uh, the first night. The Japanese, those, those were good fighters at that place. And after we got through with Peleliu, we went back to Pavuvu. Well, going back to Peleliu a minute, that was an absolute mistake. I, I read it in the hist history books later that, that uh, we were under MacArthur at that time, and he decided he's going to use the Marines for this little rough job. I don't know why he wanted that place, because it's a tiny, tiny island. wasn't inhabited by anybody except the Japanese soldiers, and it was just a bunch of rock there. But anyway, we got through with that, and we went back to, uh, to uh, Pavuvu, as we call it, the rest camp. That was in the Russell Islands. And uh, so on Christmas Day of 44, we were on uh, Guadalcanal because we, I was in artillery and we had to, had to go to Guadalcanal so they could fire the guns. We didn't have enough room on this little island that we, we were situated on. So that was one Christmas I spent out there. The Christmas before we spent down in, in, the, in on New Britain. So long about... 60 days before April the 1st, we went aboard ship, headed to Okinawa. And there was 1,400 ships in that convoy. And they zigzagged all the way up through there to, to avoid the torpedoes, you know, the Japanese had. But April the 1st, Easter Sunday, 1945, we landed on Okinawa. And that was a surprise deal right there. We walked ashore. What had happened, and we didn't know it, the day before that, some somebody pulled a smart maneuver, and, and the, whoever uh, controlled the the uh, planning of the exercise, they put a marine division on the other side of the island, and attempted to land hardly anything over there, and they didn't plan to land, so they they got a little bit of, of resistance, and uh, so the, in the meantime, before we landed the next day at the real place, uh, the Japanese all moved across across the island, so we walked ashore. So it was three or four days before we really saw it, but there was thousands and thousands of Japanese on Okinawa. And uh, we had two or three Marine divisions there and a bunch of Army divisions. Okinawa was, was rough, but it, it, and the weather there was pretty bad. We, the, the rain, they had a rainy season there, even though it was well up toward Japan, it rained an awful lot there, and the roads were terrible, no, no paved roads or nothing on that island. And there wasn't a standing building that I saw on Okinawa when we got there. They had pretty good size towns, but they were, they, they were all demolished by the time we, we made it there. But we were there, I was there when the war ended, and uh, in September, August, well, about the last August, I don't remember the exact date now, but anyway, we uh, stayed there a little while longer and then went on to North Japan, I mean, North uh, China, and uh, in Tencent, and I was, I was there for about a couple months and then came home, uh, I, I got home about Christmas of 45, after the, the war was over. So, so, so you actually went to occupy Japan? Um, no, no, not Japan. It was China. China. It was China. occupational forces in, uh, in, uh, in China. But uh, there was a lot of Japanese running around loose there on, yeah. for a few days. So I, I went on inactive duty about February of 46, because I was, I was, like I said, I was reserved. So uh, 1950, I had gotten married. In the meantime, after I got out of the service the first time, my daughter was two weeks old. I got called back during the Korean deal. I didn't much want to go then, but anyway, I was living in Decatur at the time, and I went back in October 1950. And on the way to Camp of June, I decided, well, maybe I'm going to try if... Well, I, 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 left, I left China under a CO by the name of Colonel Brown, and uh, he was a real fine fellow. But... It, so I said, I wonder if Colonel Brown sh should, could possibly be at Camp of June. I got there on a Sunday in October, miserable, rainy, and I looked in the telephone book, and he was. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I got orders. He says, I'll see you in the morning. 
So I went on down through the division supply officer next morning, and he said Colonel Brown's waiting on him. So I went back at regimental supply officer again with another artillery uh, regiment in a different division with the 10th Marines at that time. And the, due to the fact that I had stayed overseas all by most of my tour of duty, the first session I was in the Marine Corps, uh, I stayed at Camp Bajun for about three years, and it, it was real good duty, you know, no war going on. So I, I came back out and, and uh, went back to civilian job at that time. I, I hung on to, to the Marine Corps and reserve. Uh, after that, this active reserve, one weekend a month, I lived in Macon at the time for about 20 years or so. I went to Atlanta and uh, I stayed in the Marine Corps Reserve. Where was that? Where would you go in Atlanta for the reserve duty? Well, I was with a, a staff group, a six staff group, they call it. I was a supply officer there, also the G4, which is over supply and motor transport and ordnance and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, I, I, I retired at age 70. Uh, I retired in 1975 as a colonel in the Marine Corps. So I, I, I was real proud of the fact that, that I made that because it's kind of hard to make, really. Mm -hmm. And I, it does help with the, with the income on these inflated prices. That's about my life right there. I hear that. Uh, I'm going to ask you for some amplification on some of these subjects here. Because oh. I've, all right. I'm, um, I've heard that uh, after the war ended, you were living in Decatur. I first went. Can you tell me about your career? Uh, okay, uh, after as a civilian as well. Uh, okay, after the war was over, uh, I went. I went back to work with Farmers Home Administration, and I went to Gainesville, and I still wasn't married, and uh, I got kind of disgusted with that. I didn't. I didn't. Didn't like my supervisor really. He. Uh, first of all, uh, we worked five and a half days a week before World War Two. And in the meantime, they had cut the hours down to 40 hours a week. And uh, so the first week up there, uh, he said, well, I'll see you tomorrow. He said, I, I realize that uh, we don't have to work on Saturday. But he, he said, the farmers all got used to come into town on, on Saturday. And uh, uh, I'll see you in the morning. And that kind of struck me the wrong way. Now, friend, you were not in the service. I, I did seven days a week, 24 hours a day over in the Pacific. And you were sitting back here. It was, I think it was too old to go in or something. Anyway, uh, I couldn't see quite doing that. I was single, and, and I, I said, I'm not coming in in the morning. So we, we got a little disagreement going there, and I, I ran into a friend of mine that worked with the Veterans Administration in Atlanta, and he said, we got jobs over here. So I went over there and got a promotion. So I, 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 I had a little training session in, in Atlanta, and then uh, I went to Columbus in, uh, in 1946. And I, I got married down there in 1947. And then I moved to, got transferred back to Decatur with the Veterans Administration in Atlanta. That's what I was doing in, in Decatur at the time. I see. So you were, you were working for the VA? VA when I got called back during the Korean deal. Okay. Right. Um, and so three years at Camp Lejeune, um, um, North Carolina, did, did your first wife moved there with you? She then? did. She did part time. I stayed up there about seven, eight months first, and then we we bought a trailer and moved up there. And she did up there. And then we Where'd moved. you go in 1953? I went back to Decatur and worked with the Veterans Administration uh, about another year, I guess. Was that the VA hospital on? Clinton no, right it, no. This was downtown at the Bell Isle Building. I, I was an agriculture training officer. I had about 40 counties north of uh, north of Atlanta. I worked in with a disabled. Uh, agricultural trainees. They they had a training program, agricultural training program for those people who were in, you know, wounded and so forth and, mm -hmm. and that. But after uh, after the after all the training ended, then I really got out of a job in uh, 1954. It just plain ended, and I, which I knew it was going to. So I I went to Warner Robins, which is Robins Air Force Base. It's it's a big base, and I applied for. Uh, a job in uh, with them as as a uh, ag not an agricultural but but in supply because I had been supply officer in the Marine Corps and I I went to Warner Robins in 1954 and uh, uh, I retired from there in '73 wasn't it honey yeah '73 so you were actually working in, in Warner Robins all those times right I was from from '54 to '73 uh huh uh -huh. all right and what did you go when you retired from from Warner Robins I moved back home to my old home place. 
And uh, since that time, my health was still pretty good. And, and uh, even though I'd reached an old age here of retirement, I retired at age 57, but I, I, I opened up a farm machinery equipment business and chainsaws. And we sold those until about oh, two, three years ago. And then what? I just, that, that at Winterville. What was the business called? What is it called? Uh -huh. Owensby Farm Tractor and Equipment. And we got tired of fooling with that, really. And so we we built a house when she and I were married in 74. We built a new house down there. And uh, so uh, we decided to build another house and sell that place. And we did that two years ago, I guess, wasn't it? We, uh, we moved just across a pond from wh wh what I owned already on some land that my parents bought in 1910 there. And... Uh, so we built another house two years ago, and we moved it in. You built that that other house? Well, I didn't have a contractor. Let's put it that way. I hired, I hired, I bought the material, and I hired all the people. Right. And I drove a lot of nails myself. Right. That was my fifth or sixth house building. It's it's not bad when you just just get out and do it. Let's go through some of those other houses then. That, I count two <laughs> on that that family property there. Or and well, what other houses? Did well, you I, I built one at Decatur. Mm -hmm. And I built one in Columbus, mm, I guess, in Macon, one in Macon. Mm -hmm. That's right. I, that's, that's five houses, really. I've been to all those places. That's, that's, um, yeah, I, I, I lived in Macon a while, and, and uh, well, a long time. I, lived in, I didn't live in Columbus too awful long, but I built a house. You know, I, I built the first house, the whole thing, and paid for it right off the bat for six, just six to five hundred dollars. A pretty nice house. This was in 1947. You think of that. Can you recall some of those neighborhoods where you built those houses for me, um, Decatur? Or D Decatur, uh, I lived in the older section of Decatur, down close to Claremont Road, between the courthouse and Claremont Road, mm -hmm. the real, real old section. And uh, uh, in, in Macon, I lived on Winchester Circle in a fairly new section in, in Macon, and uh, Wimbish Woods. You, you lived in Macon? I, I'm dating a girl there, yes, sir. Yeah, I lived in Wimbish Woods, and it was fairly young. Mr. Burns owned all that subdivision. He's the one that had Burns Brick Company there. Uh -huh. And uh, built a house there. And I built that house in 1955, I guess. But uh, it's fun to build a house, really. She can tell you all about that on that building the house. Well, this we, leads me to my next question. We've been through. How, how did the two of you meet and, and marry? We, uh, we worked together at Warner Robins. Mm hmm and uh, in fact, she rode with me while we, we went back and forth, and she rode with me several years, I guess. I knew her a long, long time before uh, I divorced my other wife. And I, I just had one daughter, and I waited till she got grown and divorced my, my first wife. And mm -hmm. we still see her at weddings and what have you. Now, the other one, she and all three of us got together not long ago. But we're still on speaking terms. Well, and, and uh, so you moved here back to the family farm in... 1974. I moved there in 74, and, and she moved there in 75. So we were married have, in 74. Well, I don't even have a microphone hooked up to you yet, but I, I would, do you want to jump into this at all? You can. It won't hurt anything. What, oh, let me ask your wife's maiden name, um, your second wife's yeah. maiden name. Your okay, wife sure. Who's here with you? Yeah, Shirley, Shirley Sanders Thank is you. the present wife. Shirley Sanders Owensby. And the first wife of Joe Timberlake. Okay. And, uh, and where is your daughter living today? She lives in Macon. Okay. Um, was there, so you went back here to that family farm. Were, were your folks farmers on that property? Then? Very small farm. Uh -huh. And we, we had a couple of mules and we, we had a few cows and we raised chickens, pigs, and all that sort of stuff. Did you have brothers and sisters? I, ha I have no brother and sister. I had a sister that died before I was born and that, that I, was no, I was an only child. Um, had the farm been sitting there? Had your parents died at some point? Well, they died. One, one died in 1960, one died in 62. And I, I kept the place. I sold the original house and uh, uh, about 25 years ago because I couldn't keep it up. I was living away from there. But uh, this fellow that I sold it to built a brick, nice brick house right beside it. And he keeps my old house rented. Got it in real good shape. And we built a new house on about two acres just beside of it. And so I live right on the same land I used to pick cotton on. Was that time. land being farmed while... while I had it in the soil bank, had, had raised pines on it. Mm -hmm. That was about all. That's what I was curious about. Um, did you go to Winterville High School? No, I, w I, 
I went to um, a little place called Arnoldsville uh, until the 11th grade, and it was not on the accredited list, and I was hoping maybe I could go to college. So I went my last year at that time in 1932. I graduated from Mason Academy in Lexington, and uh, it no longer exists now, but anyway, it was on the accredited list for the university. And when, when did that school go under, Mason Academy? I, I don't know, uh, 10 or 15, 15 years after I graduated, I guess. They had a few more classes there. I, I don't know. I was gone most of that time. Mm -hmm. Can you recall for me uh, the events of December 7, 1941? How did you hear of Pearl, the news of Pearl Harbor? Uh, my people had a radio, and uh, that was it. One old battery-operated radio. We didn't have electricity down there then. So you had a battery operated radio. Battery operated radio heard it. About 9 or 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, we heard it here, maybe 11, I don't know. Anyway, it was rough times those days. It was real rough, but they call that the good old days, but I'd rather have it like it is now. It's much better. Where would you get batteries for that radio? Uh, it was kind of a dry cell battery. I think, I think we bought the radio, from, got it from Sears. Mm -hmm. Everything then came from Sears, just about it through a mail order deal. It, it was it was pretty rough days. You could buy uh, up until night until uh, night until World War started. You could buy a new car for uh, 900 950 brand new. The last new car I had before World War II was a 41 model Chevrolet, and you had to pay extra for the heater and the seat covers. But for 997 dollars, I got the whole works equipped, brand new automobile. And uh, I came out in February of 46, and I got a new Ford then, a 46 model Ford, the second car that they, they, they had gotten in uh, Royston after World War II, and I paid $1,046 for that car. Look what they are now. <laughs> Just think. Just think. Um, let me see. Um, you got called up again. Um, let me let me wait on that. Um, what do you guys think of MacArthur, one way or the other? Well, he he had a uh, he had a good name, but he, uh, he he turned himself into a dictator. I think uh, you know after the war he went over to Japan and set that thing up as a king type. And uh, well, isn't he the one that Truman relieved? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Mm -hmm. That's the one. And he he wasn't too great. Well, I, I saw uh, an interesting thing while we were in New Britain. We'd been, the Japanese were all dead or gone or something, and we were still there. And uh, he came ashore with some of his, his uh, aides, and they, they went out and waded ashore while the cameras were on them at that time as they were making that big landing. And that's just a, a kind of glory hunter, in my opinion. You know, it was all over, and he was in, in Australia someplace. Let me ask you about some of those other commanders. Uh, was there anybody else who stood out in your memory or who you admired or di disliked at the time? That Bull Hawes in the Navy was, was, was the man. He was, he was a go-getter. Boy, he, he wasn't scared of anything. If it hadn't been for him, I, I think we'd still be fighting that war over there. Him and Mr. Truman with the atom bomb. Cause that was the best thing they ever did. Because mm -hmm. we, we were on Okinawa getting ready to go on to Japan. And that would have been a catastrophe, and no telling. See, they, 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 would, they would defend that home and with every man, woman, and child there. How did you hear the news of that event? Well, of the two bombs. Yeah. We, uh, we, we heard just rumors of it. We really didn't, didn't know anything about it, of the atom bomb. We heard rumors of the surrender first. Uh, those days, you went to an outdoor movie. The war was over on Okinawa. We were, we were sitting in the upper end of Okinawa, and we were at a movie just pouring down rain. You took your stool and a flashlight and your raincoat and you went to the movie. So somebody come down yelling, the war is over. Shut up. Wait till the, wait till the <laughs> thing's over. So anyway, that's how we heard about it. And then it, the news leaked out about the atom bomb. We, we, didn't hear, we didn't hear anything about the atom bomb at all. But that's the best thing they ever with for that purpose. So were, was there a way the news of uh, the Japanese surrender came to you then? We, we, we heard it uh, just, just before they did it. The, the day they did it, we heard, heard that they were going to surrender. And 
uh, there was an island about five miles off of Okinawa, and they, they were supposed to come in on a plane painted white and go out on the ship where MacArthur was for the surrender purpose. And we saw the plane coming in, and they landed out there, and, and then the next day we heard the, the surrender had taken effect, you know, on the, on the, on the news. But see, there was no, no, no news much those days. We, we'd get aboard ship and we could hear a little bit of news, but we, we, we used to get aboard ship and not only did we enjoy the Navy food but for a change, but we enjoyed Tokyo Rose. Have you ever heard of that? Heard of her. I haven't heard the book. She, has, she was a, a, a Japanese. I think she lived at the, some Pearl Harbor or something, but she went back to Japan and she, she broadcast these, these things uh, for Japan. And she said, oh, we know the Marines are coming. But we've got a warm welcome for you. We've got a big, big kick out of that little deal. So we, we would hear her on the board of the ship. But we had no radios or nothing then. We didn't know what was going on. Was there anything that was particularly frightening? It sounds like it, that was a particularly uh, dangerous theater to be in. Oh, yeah, you got frightened every time you went ashore, and you got frightened during the time. But during that time, I had a rifle platoon. Uh, I, I tried to keep a big tree in front of me and the, and the bullets when they started coming our way at all times, just a little self-preservation. We got completely pinned down. Bullets was coming from both directions. And when, when the thing got through, uh, uh, dust and stuff, bark was coming down on your back. And our tanks didn't know we were up there and the Japanese were, were fighting, shooting at us. So we got caught in the middle of that thing. But anyway, we, we were on the ground enough, but you felt like digging a hole with your nose when something like that happens. You could dig a foxhole in one big hurry when, when you had to. Could you send letters? Were they censored? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah everybody. Well, we, we, we managed to get around that. As officers, we had to censor the enlisted mail. And sometimes you'd have to cut out some things that were not supposed to be. But uh, I didn't put anything in any of mine that I know should have been. So we really didn't, we, we stamped each other's letters. In other words, we each had a stamp. And we stamped it if, you know, if a good friend, you trusted him and we didn't, it, it, it was supposedly censored, but we didn't read each other's mail. But the enlisted all got, got, got censored. You had to, some of them would write everything they knew. But see, we, we'd get word before an operation, by we were going and everybody knew about it you know, on those islands because you had no way of getting the news out except writing, and so you had to watch that kind of stuff. Let me ask you about um, being an officer. Um, were you promoted? Had you studied? Um, were, you, were you doing um, officers training corps on the university campus? Or no. You... Oh, no. Uh, I, 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 I might have mentioned this. I, I don't think I did, but the first encounter I had uh, w w really with military was at this university. First two years, I was here in 34, 35, you had to take military of some kind. And I decided, well, this cavalry, they had some old worn out horses over here at that time. And so I decided that the, that would be the thing. You know, out of those two years, we rode those horses about two weeks. And the rest of the time we were marching with the infantry. And I got a bad taste for that. <laughs> for, for that. In that military right then and there, so uh, that that could and I was I really got disgusted with that Navy. You know, uh, uh, on the campus at, at Columbia University, we were John J. Hall, and we were on the thirteenth floor. We never used the elevators. They had some joker at each landing running us up those steps, and that was about the way it was. And that navigation was awful. And and all this flag waving and stuff, I just said, I ain't for the Navy. There's just, just no way. And I didn't make it along with others. We, we couldn't take that. But the Marine Corps was a lot of physical stuff, but we had a lot of school there, too. Mm -hmm. The last active duty I had in the Marine Corps before I retired, uh, they, they wanted some, some civilian uh, like me and, and still in reserve that, that could... Uh, uh, spent 30, at least 30 days on a, on the selection board at the headquarters Marine Corps in Washington, and I saw how they were elected, selected. What year was this? Uh, this was in '69, I Thank guess you. it was. The, the last 30 days I had. Still a draft for Vietnam. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. It was. But see, they still had a lot of Marine Corps reservists on, on active duty officers. Mm -hmm. And they had six regular officers on that board and me as a colonel, all of us colonels, except they had a brigadier general in charge. So we were signed, uh, we were signed two or three hundred names and, 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 the, and a big file cabinet right here with everybody's whole record from the time they were born, I think, on up and everything they had done since they had been in service. We had to go through all that stuff, and they'd ever been in any trouble, uh, got arrested for drunk driving or something, you know, while they were in service, and then you had to get up and talk about that. In other words, you had to get on your feet. Uh, about once a week, we'd get up and, and select 15 to 20, each one of us, and went around the corner, all had to vote on it. It was a rough selection. I don't know how I ever made colonel. But uh, anyway, it, it was pretty rough. So you had gone, at the, in 1969, you had been living in Warner Robins. And that was in up to Washington, for right? How long? For that... Just thirty days. Uh -huh. it was, see, I, I was still a member of the staff group in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and uh, they told me about it, so I applied for it and got got that active duty there. But uh, every day active duty added a little bit more to your retirement pay, mm -hmm. so I, I, I'm glad I hung on to that right now. Uh, let me come forward a little bit. The the two of you have moved back to to uh, the Winterville area. Um, how did you go about setting up that, that small engine business? The well, uh, I, like I said, I have a degree in agriculture. And uh, so two or three years before I retired, as a friend of mine that worked in the same outfit I did at Warner Robins, and we, we were both going to retire about the same time. And I said, what are we going to do? He said, I don't know. So he had about the same background I did with farming I did. And so we decided we'd just go into farm equipment business a little bit. So we we take a day's annual leave and go to an auction sale. And uh, I think Swainsboro was about the closest from, uh, from uh, oh, Macon at that time. We'd go over uh, to an auction sale. And so we did that a few times. I said, well, I think I'll buy some of this stuff. I had a cousin down at Winterville that was a mechanic. And I said, I could buy it and take it up there and see if he can sell it. So I got to buy tractors and bought a truck and buy tractors. And I did that two or three years, really, before. I moved up here, and I'd get him to sell the stuff, and we'd split what little profit we had or take what losses we might have. But it was, big, it was a good experience. You meet, meet a lot of, you, you know people after you get through with that. Mm -hmm. Don't let anyone have anything on the credit, just, especially your friends, because it don't, it don't pay. You agree with that? Okay. Did you work out of a, a little little space, or um, did you do it out of your house? Or? No, we. I built a... Mm, about a 30 by 90 foot building and I had a shed on that and another shed out there for equipment. We were a pretty good size, size place and uh, we, we had it set up pretty good. I did a lot of exercising. I got into the chainsaw business and that's, the chainsaw business is all right. We, we, we could buy them, a whole bunch of them, get them pretty reasonable and, you know, sell them reasonable and we sold a bunch of chainsaws. Poland chainsaws, good seller. But I just got tired of fooling with it at my age, and we wanted to do something else. We we make crafts, wooden crafts. What sort of crafts? Tell him, honey. Let, let me. You may you tell. Uh, I would love to. I'm not. It won't hurt you to get into this. Okay. If you change whatever, your mind, I would love to get you on this. But and and we uh, I cut the stuff out with a scroll saw. You know what a scroll saw is? You can cut curves, all sorts. I cut it out, and uh, she. She uh, she paints it. She took a course, one lesson, I think, in painting. She does a real good job on them things. And it's toll painting, toll painting she calls it. But anyway, it, it, they look real good. What sort of um, 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 toys or, or what sort of things are, do you typically saw up on these crafts? Um, everything. We've got bears and cats and rabbits and everything you can think of, trains and cows, cows and all that sort of stuff. Recently, we have been making clocks. We've, we've made a miniature grandfather clock. It's about 29 inches high and about, oh, I don't know, so wide. And uh, it, it's, it's done with a scroll saw, and you, you have, to, have to cut out a bunch of holes with that thing, make it out of quarter-inch oak. And uh, I think there's 180 holes in that thing that you have to cut out, and, and then you get sand it down and stain it and finish it with lacquer and all that stuff. And... We, we enjoy that kind of, we have a, on this new house that we built, we built a 30 by 60 foot metal building right behind the house. And we've got heat down there and air conditioning. 
television and that sort of stuff. And we found lots and lots of these down there just piddling around. And do you, do you sell these things from out of there? We sell them there and they occasionally we go to a craft show and sell some. Mm -hmm. We give a lot of them away to, to friends. Which craft shows do you like the best? The Marigold Festival, other ones? Oh, I don't like that Marigold. We go to, we do Crawford, which is in uh, October the 20th, 22nd, I think, and we do a pretty well at Crawford. We sell quite a bit there at, at the house. Just the, the most recent thing we've done is a friend of ours talked us into taking a glass Stain. out, staining outfit. We went last night for the first lesson. I, I, I hope we make that, but you ever cut a piece of glass? No, I haven't. That's interesting. I never had either until last night, and, and I'm getting pretty old. But uh -huh. anyway, uh, we got to get we got to do some, a lot of practice on glass cutting. But uh, it's it's going to be interesting. I hope we can make just something to do our satisfaction. That's all. <clears throat> Let me ask you a few more questions about the old days. Uh, was there anything you particularly lacked or needed or, or were short of at any point in, in, in the Depression or, or during the uh, World War II years? Well, looking, looking back from this standpoint, we were short of everything. Mm -hmm. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have running water. And uh, we, we had plenty to eat because we lived on a farm and we raised it. We raised everything we ate. And we, uh, we raised the, 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 what little cotton we raised, that was the only cash crop they had. You, you took that, that proceeds and bought a few clothes each year, maybe an ex, extra pair of overalls, another pair of shoes or something. And my daddy operated a, a corn mill for the public. He ground, ground corn, and he took toll out of the corn, and we would come to Athens to sell the meal. But uh, anyway, you, you could, we, we, we made out, but we didn't know we were so poor until we got later on and found out how everybody else lived. And <laughs> so. That's about the size of it. What did you think of Franklin Roosevelt at the time? He was the best. He, he put people back to work, and he, he got jobs going. He got the one going that I was in. It's still in existence, one of those uh, initial jobs, uh, FSA, Farm Security Administration. That's one of them. And they had all sorts of things, those CC camps and all that sort of stuff back those days. All right. And there was just no money. People were living on eight, ten, twelve dollars $12 a week those days. And, and having to support a family out of it if they could find a job. When I, in 1932, uh, when I finished high school in 33 in there, I, I went to all sorts of places in Athens trying to get a job. You know, 16, 17 year old kid that, that they didn't have any, no experience. They didn't need anybody anyway. I went to cotton mills and all sorts of places around here. Just no jobs you could get, nothing. It's, it's, it's hard to believe that that happened, but it did. Just looked like all the money just went out all at once. It just banks closed everywhere in 1929 to 30 in there. So just just no no money to be had. But I I doubt if my my people had over five hundred dollars cash at one time in their whole life. It just they just never didn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh. Well, I often um close these interviews, I don't have to make this my last question, but I, I often ask if you, if you were talking to younger people about that era, uh, what would you want them to remember the most? Uh, get all the education you can get. That right now these kids are not getting the education that they, that they sh should. They, they've got opportunities, but they won't take advantage of it. My daughter didn't. I had the mother to send her to college. She absolutely refused to go, and she regrets it. She's 44 years old now, and she regrets it right this minute, but get all the education you, you can get. I managed to get through the university pretty much on my own. And if it had not been for that, I wouldn't have had that good paying job of $120 a month while other people were making $12, a, you know, $12 a week. And on the other hand, I would not have been a retired as a colonel in the Marine Corps because I couldn't have been commissioned without that that four years college. So I would, my advice is get all the education you can get, regardless of what kind of a, a future you think you might have. The, the, the money, the present day money is not everything. Just go ahead and try to get that schooling. Which brings up, um, can you tell me anything else about old days at the University of Georgia, uh, where you lived at that time? I lived at home and came back, went back and forth. 
How would you get back? In the well, we, we had an automobile uh -huh. of sorts, and there's four or five of us down there that, that got together. We'd do maybe one week at a time. Was one year, carpool? Uh, carpool. One week, I mean, one, one year, I lived on campus at old Candler Hall, I believe it was. I don't know if it's still there or not. But for five dollars a month to get get a room, and my people could help me a little bit, and then I worked down at the dining hall, and uh, poured uh, coffee, tea, and so forth, and looked after desserts down there. Got my meals free, so I, I managed that way. But you know, tuition was only thirty-five dollars a month when I first two years I was there. It was it was hard, and classes maybe. Twenty in the class. Now I don't know what they've got over there. Well, now you got the books that cost another Book. couple hundred. That's dollars. right. Um, have you been able to travel in the years of your retirement? Have you been able to, to travel? Have you seen? Uh, <laughs> That's a good question for her. We we don't do much traveling. I just mm -hmm. don't care to travel much. No, we we've, we've traveled a little bit. We we made a trip to Niagara Falls up in Canada and mm -hmm. a few a few places like that. Last few years, I've been digging into my family history, and we've been to a few places like that. Where have you been to do genealogy? Well, I, I, I've been to Asheville most of the time, and I've got a, uh, I found out that my, my great grandmother was named Israel, and I was up in, uh, in Asheville one day in the genealogical society. I saw a book, The Children of Israel by Dr. Kenneth Israel, and I looked at the book, and I found my mother's daddy's name in that thing. And I asked this fellow how to get in touch with him, and he said he picked up the phone and called him. He's living in Asheville. And he asked me what relation I was, and I told him that this Emily Israel was my great-grandmother. And he said, well, won't you come out? I'll show you around. And that was the beginning, really, of, of digging into to where you come from. And he, he took us on about a 75-mile tour of Buncombe County and showed me places. He said, now, your great-great-great-grandfather gave the land for this church and all that sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, uh, that that was that was one thing that that I, I found I discovered from kin. I never knew I was kin to anybody by the name of Israel, and that led to other things way on up the line in his people. But uh, we we hadn't been too far. But I've I've got a lot of digging around Blairsville, as, mm -hmm. in in this state that uh, I've, I've still got relatives up there, and I found found on my on the orange side. Uh, he he knew all about that and. They were all tied in together back there, the Israels and the Owens. So it's been interesting to find out where you came from and how they lived back then. Oh, yeah. That's, the, I imagine you've seen the Heritage Room over there. Um, I'm also interested in the Korean conflict and, and uh, um, the way the Army changed somewhat. Um, Truman was famous for having uh, uh, desegregated the armed service around 1948. Yeah. You see? more colored servicemen in the Korean conflict or, or uh, they were just begin they were just beginning to come in in, uh, in integration during that time we had in the regiment I was in at Camp of June in 1951 and 52 we had two or three that had integrated at that time in, in the Marines in World War two the, the Monot they, they were entirely separate mm -hmm. separate group of people but uh, they it gradually it started in in the in the Truman days, and it's there's a lot of them in there now, which is a good thing, really. They live in this country; they might as well go help fight for this country. But they they did quite a bit in World War II, but it wasn't the jobs out in the combat jobs. I think most of the truck drivers and stuff like that. You know, few of those. I saw a few on. Uh, I guess it was an army on uh, on Peleliu. Mm -hmm. uh, very few. Um, can you go back to uh, um, deciding to be a Marine? Did you have to go through another period of, of training uh, um, there? Did you have uh, what I associate with a, 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 a sergeant that uh, I associate the Marines having a really particularly tough, oh, tough bunch there? It was tough. Those, those were the days when they slapped you around if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. I fortunately made out pretty good there, but I, I tried to do what I was told to do. But uh, it, it was it, it was rough trying. We had I did I saw a second lieutenant once or twice, and in, in there. But uh, most of the time it was sergeants. When, I, I went in the Marines in the Marines as PFC, mm -hmm. and uh, because of the fact that we were going to officers training school, and uh, got a, my pay then uh, was fifty four dollars a month as a private first class. They just had raised the pay then in service from thirty dollars 
to $50 a month. It hadn't been very long. I don't know when it was. It was just before I went in that they had raised it up there. Where were you stationed? This was at uh, Quantico, Virginia, mm -hmm. for the first. I was there the first 10 weeks as, as uh, PFC and then commissioned in February of 42. And then I uh, stayed there 10 more weeks as reserve officer there and then came, came to Camp Majune after that in the summer of, of 43. Um, and uh, can you tell me anything about the popular culture of the time? Was there music or, or, or uh, uh, any books or anything, any, anything you, you uh, particularly enjoyed hearing on the radio? Oh, yeah. Uh, Amos and Andy and all those sort of things. And uh, I, don't, I don't recall some of those programs, but you used to look forward to, to, to some of the radio programs. But to see, the, the TV didn't come out until about 1952, 51 to 52, I guess it was. At least we didn't have one. Mm -hmm. But it, it was poor reception, even those days when that first TV came out. When it came out with color, I didn't believe it. I still don't understand radio. You know how it, how it comes out, but anyway, it's here. One of those miracles we have, Irene. Did you get to see some of the West Coast? Quite a bit. I, I was at uh, Camp, uh, hmm, out, out from San Diego. I don't even remember the name of the camp. It's a rough, run-down Navy base. Uh, I was out there for, for about two months. And I, I went down uh, uh, in Mexico a time or two, and, and I've, I've been to L.A., and I've been to San Francisco, and a little bit of that. But the only Marine base I've ever really been on much at, at, at uh, Camp Bajun. I, I miss Paris Island that you heard about. Mm -hmm. I was discharged from there in 1946 in Paris Island. Got a bad taste of that place over there. Never been there before. First lieutenant at that time. No automobile, no nothing. Pouring down rain the whole time. I had to check out. This was in February of 46. And... I had to go to the swimming pool to get somebody to say that I didn't owe them anything or had any of their equipment. Swimming pool was closed. And I had to go to the library, which I didn't know where it was. I got soaking, sopping wet. I came back here, they wouldn't even give you a Jeep or nothing, no transportation, nothing. You just walked around all these various places to get checked out, which was absolutely ridiculous. Military has, has sometimes got its drawbacks. and Don't use some common sense right in there. But I got a bad, that's the only time I've ever been to Paris Island. I don't care for that place. And I don't know most of these enlisted that's ever been there don't like it either, because that's rough. I've, I've been near that one. I haven't been to Quantico. Do you feel, do you feel that uh, the, the um, basic training you got at Quantico was not quite so rough as... as well, it was the same thing the first 10 weeks. Oh, it was the same thing. It's the Paris Island was loaded those days, and then... We went straight to Quantico because that was where we would have wound up the 10 weeks after that in the school. And Quantico's got a good Marine Corps school now, real good. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we made a lot of, lot of tracks around that place in that mud at Quantico. But it, it was, I couldn't take that anymore, but it was, it, it was bad while we were going on. May I ask how you met, met your first wife? Yeah, in Columbus, in church. And this, I, I had a room in this... this uh, a room in house and this lady says somebody want you to meet over here and so she introduced me uh, to her said her name was Joe Timberlake and I had known uh, of a Timberlake preacher that was a Methodist preacher where I used to go to church down here when I was around home I said is your dad a Methodist preacher and she said yes I said well you live at Winterville she said yes so that's that's how I knew her. so and your daughter is still in Macon? Still in Macon. She has two two kids. I have one great grandson. We're gonna see him tomorrow. Um how did it feel to uh, uh spend all those years in Warner Robins? I I've uh, been down to visit that Museum of Aviation yeah. that they have now. But they might not have had that at the time. They didn't. No, it it's it's I don't know what the year they oh I never have been to it myself. We've been to the aviation at uh Pat Pensacola. Mm -hmm. uh, we went down there with a the, with a cousin to Pensacola a few years back and went to the aviation. Well, they must have been in the thick of the Cold War and and quite a quite a military buildup in in Warner Robins. Georgia. Oh, they were. Well, I, I worked with with the uh, the B fifty two. I had the uh, the responsibility for the fire control system and the navigation system for the for the B fifty two. And it was always a, 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 a tragic thing about to happen to them. You know, everybody hit the panic button all the time 
and you'd get all these deadlines every time something something happened like that. But uh, see, the, the, those big aircraft came out after World War II. Mm -hmm. Really, we didn't have well helicopters in World War II. Mm -hmm. We saved a lot of lives there if we had, but they came out and all these these uh, jet planes and everything. The World War II always has prop jobs. It, like the B-25 was the B-29 was the last one they had that I saw in combat, and it just had come out just before the war was over. I saw a B-29 spin around and burn up on the, on the field of Okinawa. But they, 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 they were late coming out. B-25, B-26s were, were what they had when, when I came along. Did you fly much during the World War II? No, I never, never was on the, I was, I was strict to ground. Let me ask you about one more thing during the, the Cold War era. Um, uh, you must have been on the Warner Robins base during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was. Did, uh -huh. uh, did that filter down? Uh, did you uh, know what was going on? Oh yeah, we all did. She was. She, she, uh, she worked communications down there, and uh, it, 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 we all knew about that. Mr. Kennedy, I think, let him down on that one. He promised him air support and didn't do it, as I understand it. Are you talking about the Bay of Pigs? Uh huh. That's right. And then uh, it was after the Bay of Pigs that uh, they got into this big deal about putting missiles in yeah. Cuba um, and a big war of words with Russia. Did, did that, do you remember that at all? I, I remember that, oh yes. Uh, I, I, don't, I, we, we, I don't know, to tell you the truth, I don't, know, don't remember exactly what had happened on that one mm -hmm. uh, so far as the Air Force was concerned because there's all kinds of sections and divisions in that Air Force. Well, can you tell me anything about the, the buildup of the Vietnam era? Because it sounds as if you're, before you retired, you're probably hearing about that a great deal. Oh yeah, we, we'd get calls two or three o'clock in the morning from, from Vietnam, you know, two or three o'clock our time. Uh -huh. We'd get called all the way through there, wanting this and wanting that. And maybe you'd shipped it, maybe you hadn't shipped it, maybe you couldn't get it in the way of supply. Because the, the the B fifty two we had the turrets and all that sort of stuff that went on the thing and and uh, it, it was it was a job to quite get them all the way back here to repair them and send them back that distance and we 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 were we were uh, deep into that one that was mostly the B fifty two that I'm talking about mm -hmm. that's the only bomber they still have now that's still flying that I know of. still flying a few but they made a bunch I was there doing all the time they were building most of them. But they discarded. I don't think they have many left. They could. You still hear about them, though. Um, well, let me bring it to a close. Um, um, there must have been an awful lot of changes that you've seen in this office, this period you described. You told me you like it. You like it much better now. I should. But is there anything that you uh, particularly miss from from uh, the the um, days of 50 or even 60 years ago, or or, or before that? I don't know what I miss any of that, really. Mm -hmm. But uh, those days we couldn't have a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have running water. And you couldn't have, you really couldn't buy the things that you wanted those days because you didn't have the money. Now, if you make it and manage it right, you can have just, most anybody can have just about anything they want, you know, within their reason. How often would you go between Winterville and Athens before you started at the university? I, I never, I never, you mean, Go between Winterville and Athens. Yes, sir. Uh, about once a week, mm -hmm. we uh, <laughs> we we raised vegetables, or quite a few vegetables, and my dad had to support us somehow. So uh, we we carried things to Athens and and uh, over in East Athens especially, and we sold what we had out of the garden. We sold milk and butter, and eggs and chickens, and and vegetables in season. He'd take one side of the street, and I'd take. And I was selling stuff at nine, ten years old. You know, we'd take home for ten, fifteen dollars. That was quite a bit of money those days. Mm -hmm. We 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 did that, and then we sold meal because they had that cornmeal there. But about we we about once a week is all we get to town. They didn't have paved roads. If you've been to, mm -hmm. they ended. Uh, do you know where Dr. Michael Hanna lives? No, on, on down the Lexington Road, mm -hmm. uh, the pavement ended there, and it was in the early thirties that it's went on through Clark County and went on through Oglethorpe County in about 33. And there was dirt roads everywhere, nothing paved in Winterville. Those days, then you, you turned off of the road in Athens going toward Winterville and uh, out there by where that Phillips Oil Company is, is the road used to go about through there, 
all dirt, all the way. We didn't know what paved roads were until you got to where Dr. McLean lived. So they probably paved that road through um, Winterville to Arnoldsville that way in 33 or 34? No, they paved it much later than that. When would that be? It was, uh, let's see, I was probably living in, it's after World War II before they paved it. Okay. Uh, let's see, out home is about 1950. I would say they paved that, or 52 or something, from out, from Winterville to Arnsville, up down. There used to be a railroad there mm -hmm. until they took the railroad up. But it's the place place where it was is still there. But anyway, it, it was paved in the 50s. When did your father move to that land? Oh, 19 when? about 1910. Okay. They they moved and covered wagons from Blairsville, which mm -hmm. is about 100 miles down. There's a there's an area in that section. Uh, about a five mile square filled with the people that came from Union County, mm -hmm. those mountaineers, and uh, a lot of descendants like me are still still living down there. But they bought land on credit from a man by the name of Nat Arnold, who owned most of that land in there, and he bragged about it, how he, he had gotten their money and they would never be able to pay for it. He'd take the land back. It wouldn't have paid for it. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what thrifty people he was dealing with. So they'd been living on a half acre corn patch up there, you know. They had no cash crops up that way, so they, they came down here for, to, uh, you know, raise cotton and make cash. So that was, and then the bow we was hit and knocked them out of business on that one. I'm very grateful you came in to speak to me today, sir. Um, is there anything you care to add about the era of World War II or about the rest of your career? Well, I'm, I'm glad it's over, and I hope nobody ever goes back to those Depression days. Uh, we just don't need that. But uh, we've got a lot of crime now. We didn't have those days. Mm -hmm. you, you, you could leave and come to town and leave your doors unlocked, and nobody ever bothered to thing those days. No stealing, none of that stuff. Never to hear of it. The crime rate is terrible now. I hope we don't go go back to the depression days like we were. That's about all I've got. Hey, that's a great deal. Thank you for your time. Oh, okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Owens P., um, would, could I talk into saying anything at all? Would there be anything you care to add? I am speaking with Mrs. Owens P. on the same day, which is Wednesday, 14th, and I just wanted to ask her what she remembered of hearing about Pearl Harbor on um, December the seventh of nineteen forty-one, how you how you heard that news? Or I really don't remember hearing it as such because I was just seven years old then. But um, I'm sure they they had it a radio like he described that they heard it on where they lived. A battery radio. Yes, definitely. I, I remember battery radios. The reception was terrible. Got more static. static than you did actual voices. <laughs> but um, I'm sure that's the way they heard it, too, was by radio. Where had you grown up? I grew up in Bleckley County, uh, in middle Georgia, mm -hmm. below Macon, about 40 miles. And when you went to work at Warner Robins, how old were you? Uh, 18. Uh -huh. I didn't go to college. I just went to a business school. And from that business school, then I went to Warner Robins at the Air Force Base in uh, 53. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Do, can you tell me anything about the Korean conflict or, or the end of that or the, the era, the Cold uh, War? Was it, was it a really. busy place to work? She uh, work yeah, well, in well, 53. I'm, I'm in anything she remembers. Uh, I was. I remember mostly the, uh, I guess the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was working at Warner Robins, mm -hmm. it was a busy time because we had worldwide responsibility for certain aircraft. Mm -hmm. Of course, aircraft are very important, so that's. It was an exciting job at times, because you know you could be responsible for an aircraft on the ground, and maybe they didn't have too many at one place, and they had to go and. We called them ANFIs, aircraft not fully equipped. And when you get one of those in, a requisition, you had to, it, if it took day and night, you had to get that item back to them to get that aircraft off the ground. And I worked in communications, which was very important. I couldn't go without it, so it was an interesting job. 
I worked there for uh, from 53 to 70 for 21 years. Did you have to wear uh, a uniform? No, no, uh-uh. civilian? We were civilian, but they had strict, uh, or, uh, I can't think of the word. Dress code? Dress code, yeah, right. I know, uh, I think it was in probably about 72 before they would even let the women wear slacks. You had to wear dresses, dressy tights in the offices. Were you still living in Cochrane at that time, or did you move No, to no, I moved to Macon in 1957. I lived there till I moved to Winterville in 75. Well, uh, do you remember the end of World War II at all? Do you have any memory uh, of that? One thing that stands out in my mind about that is the day that it happened. It was still over radio, and I remember the police in that small town went around and they had those speakers that they were saying the war is over the war is over and uh in I, yeah in cochran and i remember we all went to church and had a service at the church prayer meeting and singing everybody was so happy it was over because there were a lot of young boys in that little town that went into the service and they lost a lot i had two brothers that were in it of course they home okay but i remember the whole town was happy about the end of that World War II. Are your brothers still alive? No, 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 no. Where did they live? Where did they, where, where, where did they? One of them lived in Warner Robins and one in Macon. And they both died from heart disease, which was inherited through my dad's side of the family. They both had emphysema from smoking, which is a bad habit. Well, thank you very much for speaking with me, ma'am. Thank you for letting me speak. Anything you care to add? No, I don't think, I don't think so. I think we've pretty well covered it. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> grateful you spoke a little bit. Okay, thanks. No, no running water and no, no heat whatsoever. The cold showers. It was, it was pretty rugged living, living in a tent. So I had all the camping I want. Mm -hmm. No more of that, thank you. <laughs> Camped out. Years and years in a tent. But we didn't see any sort of civilization from the time I left San Diego until I got back uh, in, at Christmas 45, except in China for about two months. But that's not our type of civilization there. You, the only people we saw were those natives in the, in the Pacific. How did, how did China impress you? That's a, boy, that was a dirty place yeah. those days, filthy. Overcrowded? Overcrowded. You, you drive down yeah, the street man. in a Jeep. And, and uh, the sidewalks won't hold them. They and the, take the whole street and both sidewalks, and you just push your way through the jeep, and it could fill back up like water right behind you. That was one crowded place. The the uh, sanitation facilities there are awful. They, they 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 bathe and everything right in the river, and and that's the kind of water they have. I don't know how they live to be 40 years old in, in China. They've changed now. I hope they have. Hard to say. Um, how long were you stationed in China? I was only there about a couple of months. Uh -huh. uh, we went there after we left Okinawa, after the war was over. But China is a pretty rough country. But this was North China, it was close to, to, to uh, Tencent then, which is now Beijing or something, they changed the name of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever, close to the Great China Wall. But it, it got cold, that place. Mm -hmm. It was cold. Was that, what was the, the hardest winter? At that time, I think of the the Pacific as being a tropical it region. It is. Well, there was but no, what, no winter was down there, nothing but rain uh -huh. all the time. But uh, we got in China, it got cold. Uh -huh. they, they could drive the, the trucks across the rivers frozen so bad. It was. It got real cold in China. The worst winter you had was in Quantico, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that winter <laughs> Quantico was terrible. Oh goodness. That would have been the winter of 43? 42 and 43. 42, 43. I went there in December of 42. Uh-huh. And, boy, there, it was some rough weather there. But the, I slept in the rain for days and days in that Pacific, in that first combat operation in, on New Britain. That was 20-something days. Right in the rain. What else could you do? I had no place to go. And we just kept pushing. Never had a coffin, no hot meal, nothing for over 20 days. I lost, I died, I weighed 100 pounds when I got through that mess. But I knew I had to get out of the infantry. Did you see some Japanese, sir? Oh, yes. They were all over the place. Mm -hmm. I saw them. 
and they saw us too. Mm -hmm. Those days won't happen again. I hope not. Well, so both hope not. But uh, very, I'm very grateful for everything you talked about with me. As well, thank you. Uh, what about a copy of that? Is it possible to get? Yeah. A